So Dr. Michaela Rivera is our uh, guest speaker today. Thank you so much for being here. And I'm really happy to say you are finally the first woman presenter we've had with New Mexico New this year. So I'm really happy to have a woman here sharing her knowledge with us and want to uh, invite other women out in the community. If you have something to share through a learning program, we would love to hear from you or if you know about other women. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about Michaela. She is a licensed clinical psychologist an author and public speaker. She's a native of Santa Fe. She received her bachelor's degree from New Mexico State University and her doctorate from Michigan State University where she was a Ford fellow. She completed an internship at the LA Psychiatric Service and then worked in community mental health an employee assistance program and private practice in Tucson, Arizona. After returning to New Mexico, she has worked in her own private practice and continues to do so today. She's worked in early childhood administration with the New Mexico Children, Youth and Families Department, as well as Head Start. Dr. Rivera served as a clinical director and provided um, assessment and treatment of children, adolescents and families and couples at Samaritan Counseling Center here in Albuquerque, as well as in private practice. She has been published. She published the Minority Career Book and uh, co-authored the US Latino Entrepreneur's Guide to Balancing Business, Family, and Culture. Dr. Rivera currently serves as a grief counselor in addition to her private practice for French funerals and cremations. So we want to thank both French Funerals as well as Dr. Rivera for providing this incredible information to us today and for being here. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. So Dr. Rivera, I will hand it over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Tammy. And uh, I appreciate the kind introduction and most of all, the opportunity to be here with folks in the community who are interested and committed to remaining active um, because it simply ages is a matter of uh, years passing. It doesn't mean that um, we become stagnant in what we're doing. So I think New Mexico New is an exciting opportunity. And today the topic is gonna to be grief. Uh, usually people don't jump up and say, yay, we're gonna talk about grief because uh, it's a painful thing to go. However, my experience has been that if we don't uh, go through grief, it waits for us, okay? So part of the thing to keep in mind today would be to remember that the process of grief across our lives, not simply about death, and I won't linger talking about death, but um, part of grief is its purpose in transforming us. And that is really one of the key components. It is not without some merit, as painful as it can be. So today I'm going to talk about a variety of things. Uh, and I really encourage participation from uh, the audience because we learn most from each other. We're going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about things that all of us, I trust, have either been through or have read about or both or experience, that is the death of loved ones and developmental stages. We, we often talk about the death of loved ones and that's usually what people think about. But developmental stages growing from the time we are born through the end of our life, our lives is a, there are developmental stages. And with each stage comes uh, opportunity for growth and it's coupled with loss, changes, Change always brings loss. It also brings opportunity. So today I wanna to focus on both of those things, including really staying open for Oh, Michaela, you're muted all of a sudden, sorry. Did 
There you go. Thank you. Or I was talking about the opportunities in loss, that it's not simply a matter of the sorrow that goes with grief and loss, but also the opportunities and the growth that occur at every stage of life even when people are not aware of it. So that's what is meant by the developmental stages. I'm gonna talk a little bit about, um, uh, go back, there you go, thank you, uh, to COVID-19 and its variants. There's been a lot of grief about that. People use grief as kind of a slang word uh, when it comes to that, but there's some very serious implications, obviously, to what we've been through. And then we're gonna talk about life as we knew it and life as it now is, and that's the topic of today's conversation. So all of it leads to that because we're evolving and that's what we're going to do. Okay. So let me talk a little bit with um, Jesus and Tammy. Uh, what are some of the areas that you have experienced loss and grief with age? Can you share some of that? Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll be happy to start. Um, I think um, you know, in particular, over the last couple of years, um, uh, I think uh, with COVID in particular, it, it's introduced a level of, um, uh, I guess I would say, where closure is lacking um, in terms of individuals that I've known personally. And uh, generally for me, it's it's attending services and, uh, you know, uh, providing my condolences and, and sympathies to uh, individuals as part of the grieving process. And that's something that's been eliminated. Uh, you know, it's, uh, we have attended uh, uh, certain parts of, um, uh, or certain services, but it's, it's just difficult for me personally <laughs> to have closure um, when I'm, I'm not able to, you know, uh, again, extend my condolences or sympathies to family members. Um, and, you know, realizing that it's, it's a circle of life. And um, during the past year, uh, over the course of uh, probably four to six weeks, um, we had in our family um, death of a beloved aunt, um, the uh, marriage of a, one of our nephews, and the birth of uh, a young, uh, uh, or the birth of a baby of one of uh, my other nephews. So in a very short period of time, we went from, you know, the entire circle of life of uh, ending, you know, a, a, a long and fruitful life of the beginning of, of another and then of another with a marriage and then bringing a new life into the world. And, and it's, it is the circle of life, but it, you know, it, it, it just made it, has made it difficult um, uh, for me, and I'm sure others, to be able to, to fully um, close uh, on, on individuals that, that were friends and we weren't able to attend services because of COVID. Okay, okay. So what you're reflecting, Jesus, is really part of getting through grief is the social aspect. Mm -hmm. that it's shared with the support and the companionship of others. And when that yeah. feels more distant, it doesn't quite feel as full or as complete as what you would. Yeah, that's that's exactly, um, you know, you've said it very well, Michaela. And, and that's, you know, I think that's part of the, uh, of the process. And, and, you know, as we talk more about grief not being part of death necessarily, that it's, it's uh, other aspects of, of uh, what we encounter and how that transforms transform our lives. You know, that's something that, I, that is uh, new to me because uh, I generally associate grief with the passing of, you know, uh, relatives, friends, things of that nature. So that's really important that um, I understand that, that aspect of grief. Well, good. I'm glad that that's helpful because mm -hmm. it really is part of, the journey as we go along, uh, even though you're right, people emphasize when someone dies, which right. is obviously irreversible, but um, good points that you made. Thank you. Tammy, did you have anything you wanted to share? 
Sure, I'll, I can add to that a little bit different um, experience. All of those things, same things are true um, in my experience as well. But I think as a single woman um, over the past year, I it's really been um, quite isolating, uh, you know, since COVID started in early 2020 and everything kind of came to a screeching halt. I think adjusting to the isolation and just being really alone. My family lives in Texas, and so I'm a little bit of a distance. So it was, you know, challenging to be able to see, go see family, but also just being alone so much um, really has taken a toll. And that shift in, you know, your ability to just be able to go out and do things and. I'm finding that it's had an impact on me. Like now I almost don't wanna go out and do things. I mean, I do, but I it's somehow more challenging or difficult and things seem more difficult to do. I don't know if that's just my experience, but um, I'm really paying attention to how I've got to readjust to being able to go out a little more often now and just getting ready to go out even seems like a lot sometimes these days, because I'm so used to being home all the time. Um, so that's, a. I mean, I could go on, but to me, that's a real, that's really the root of it, um, is adjusting to those major changes in life that I never saw coming. And all of a sudden, and, you know, at a, what I feel is still a pretty young age, being isolated and alone. Uh, absolutely. And that's one of, been the, the, one of the more unnerving aspects Tammy, of the pandemic. We certainly understand the science behind it, the risk in uh, certain decisions, et cetera. But really to suddenly experience the difference between what started out as a two week quarantine that felt like a national vacation. And yes. oh, we're, you know, it's kind of like an extended snow day. Two week rolling into months, rolling into years was quite unexpected and unnerving. And, and I'll circle back to that. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. Let me let me address again one of the things that Jesus brought up, and then we'll get into COVID in particular. Jesus was talking about uh, being more aware of the developmental stages, okay? Uh, and the developmental stages are very predictable uh, because people go through them uh, just as a function of time and, and development. Uh, some of them are unexpected. As we get older, some of them are planned. Some of them uh, don't occur as we as we think they're going to. But basically, the developmental stages uh, are things in general for people developmentally are things like um, birth. Um, well, it's it's marriage, pregnancy, and childbirth. It's children's transitions through school. It's, it's no fluke that parents, uh, especially new parents, um, when they have their first child going through school for the first time, it's no fluke that people are crying at the door of the kindergarten. Adults are crying, not children. Uh, children are ready to run off and play and people are very moved. But there's, with every gain in life, every positive thing, there's loss. Uh, marriage uh, brings much happiness and uh, fulfillment, fulfillment, hopefully, of a relationship. On the other hand, people who have recently gotten married will know, gee, there's certain things I miss. And they'll say, I thought that I was supposed to be happy. Well, we're going to leave the shoulds out of it for today. But those are the things that can kind of unsettle people. Because with every single uh, developmental stage comes the loss. And that's what I've been talking about because grief is statutory. Other things are... Um, our own aging, but also coping with our aging parents. Some of us are still helping our parents. Others of us uh, have gone through that entire cycle already and no longer have our parents. So a little further down the road, some circumstances more difficult and prolonged than others. Not easy any way you cut it and there's no escaping it anyway. So those are the types of things and um, Another developmental stage is one that, that uh, Jesus has recently uh, gone through, as have um, many of the people tuning in today, and that is retirement. Officially leaving a job, 
uh, especially if we still came from the era where people stuck with a job for a fairly long time, didn't do a lot of job switching and job changing. Um, there comes an end to the formal structure of that and a shift in what we choose to do. So those are the developmental stages. Uh, there are other things that happen in life that come just with uh, age. Uh, I mentioned the empty nest. And as cliche as that sounds, having one's children, especially if you've had a positive, loving, close relationship with them, having them move far away or move out of the house um, can be a big one, um, often is. Uh, there can be unexpected lifestyle changes. Uh, suddenly people are retired and they're happy grandparents and all of a sudden they're called upon to raise the grandchildren. Very common, it's very, very common in New Mexico. And the, the one good part of it is the children have grandparents who can hopefully take care of them. The challenge is the grandparents may not have been prepared to do that. So you have these retirement plans and all of a sudden, whoa, this, is, this was not quite on the, on the list. So that's a very, very common. Uh, or becoming a caregiver. You worked your life, your whole life, you raised children, you did all of the things you're supposed to do. Get to the stage of life where, okay, now we can relax and your mate or you yourself become ill. So you can become a caregiver thinking, I thought we were going to travel. This wasn't planned. So it's that recurrent loss of, gee, this was our hope and dream. And sometimes that's what people dream is the dream, the hope of it, is that we know certain things aren't going to happen. And so it's not the same as death that you, we attend in a formal way at a funeral or memorial, but it's that slow realization that, oh, I guess certain things aren't going to happen, either because of health or finances or other circumstances. So those are some of the big things. Um, ad adjusting to our own physiological changes. You know, people always say, well, in my mind, I'm really young. I can, I can say that for myself. I think I'm about... 33 in my mind my body didn't get the email okay my body has kept on going and uh and it's hard because you know you hear other people who are older say you just wake up some morning and there are aches and pains and all of a sudden you wake up and you know what there's aches and pains so part of this is the adjustment and the management that goes with our physiology and what we can do, how we can maintain ourselves, et cetera. But, um, you know, one of the jokes that people often talk about is being able to get up off the floor. Now, heaven forbid there's falls, you know, we don't want people falling. And, but we, uh, some of us know what it's like to have a real struggle getting up, you know, and there have been, you know, skits on Saturday Night Live and things like that, making fun of those commercials. But in reality, it's quite something to experience a fall that you cannot uh, get up from unassisted. Excuse me. So all of those are changes, changes that we haven't necessarily expected, but we're suddenly faced with. And the adjustment to a chronic illness. Um, when we're officially diagnosed, there typically is a care plan. You know, you think you're told we'll do this, 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 and this, and follow it to manage it. And it's, it's difficult because your sense of uh, decision-making suddenly shifts and you have to decide, is, um, is this a decision I want to make and is it good or what's the possible impact? And one of the things that's hard with decision-making is that we don't always feel the impact immediately, particularly with adjustment to chronic illness. We can say, oh, I'll just do it this time and then I... I'll just I'll eat something or I'll skip exercise or I'll do whatever it is that we know is not the best decision, but it's very delayed in its effect. Kind of like when you eat a plate of brownies. Think, oh, I'll just have two, two or three. I mean, it's a special holiday. And then before you know it, it's easy to pack on the pounds, right? And so those are the types of adjustments that come with age and with physiological and chronic illness. Um, so the traditional stages of grief, uh, which are on the next slide, 
thanks are those that we typically recognize. And I won't deal a lot on this information because I think a lot of us have experienced and read about it. But the state, the traditional original research stages of grief and loss were shocked. You can't believe it happened. Uh, even with prolonged illness uh, that ends up in a death, um, people will often say, I can't believe it happened, even though it's been going on for years. It's because you've suspended all of the grief and put the energy into the caretaking and all of a sudden it's over. So there's the shock. Or it can be your own adjustments as well uh, to either the shutdown of a business or the loss of income. The denial, it can't be true. Um, the bargaining, which is basically a dialogue between, typically it's between a higher power and oneself about if you take this burden, I will do whatever just relieve me of the sorrow. And then there's the depression and anger. These stages are not linear. They go back and forth. So it's kind of a, oh, I guess I'd call it a roller coaster, frankly. People say that some days they're very hopeful and uh, reach acceptance uh, and some sense of resolution. With, by the way, acceptance not meaning that you approve or like it. Acceptance simply means it is what it is. Okay, because people will often tell me in my work, they'll tell me, I just can't accept it. Well, I can certainly understand and appreciate that some things we will never like or agree with. But acceptance is crucial to being able to reach resolution. And resolution is one of the things that I'm going to really talk about today and in the panel and the audience in doing, and that is how do we re redefine ourselves? After each loss and grief, really, let's fast forward and get to what are we talking about with resolution? Because we are left with having to figure out what next. Some people are more prepared than others. Some people end up in situations that are more controllable. Regardless, you still have to decide. So that's what's important about resolution. And you can go, you know, from day to day between these stages. You can go hour to hour between these stages. You can wake up feeling terrific and be bluer than blue or highly anxious an hour later. And it can be brought on by an unknowing reminder. Um, when we've lost some someone or some role in our life, Suddenly, you know, we might go to open the junk drawer, what I call the junk drawer in the kitchen. I just trust everybody has a junk drawer. And you open it, and all of a sudden, there's your loved one's special tape measure. And it just brings it all flooding backward. You walk in, and the smell of the person's favorite food is the food is cooking on the stove, takes you right back. Or it can be uh, if you are no longer working and it wasn't your choice. Go to your closet and the clothes that you used to wear to go to work hang there patiently on their hangers. And you realize, well, I'm not going to need that one anymore. So there's this cycle goes through. Um, these stages are in the grief cycle of all change in our lives. Some we go through more easily. Some we don't. So um, I would really like to know um, how have you experienced grief? And as this relates to it, how, how does it um, show itself, especially now um, during the pandemic? And how has it been related in the pandemic? Any input from our participants? So you can respond in the chat or you can raise your hand if you want to ask a question. Um, I'll just kick it, I'll kick it off for you, um, Dr. Rivera. I, I know that it's been a little surprising to me to feel the level of anxiety that I've felt. I've never thought of myself as someone who experiences anxiety prior to the pandemic, mm -hmm. but I notice a lot of that seems to happen. And, um, you know, then you do, I really have noticed how some days I wake up and 
feel great. And other days I'm just like really anxious. Um, and it's a little confusing, you know, how, how to manage all that. And I'm not even really clear what I'm anxious about necessarily. Um, and I, I, when I really sit and think about it, it's just, there's too much to try to take in with the political environment, the social changes, the being isolated. It's just kind of numbing, I guess, or something. Um, anyway, that's, that's what comes up for me when you ask that. It can be pretty overwhelming and anxiety is always a, you know, um, it's, it's almost a hundred percent present with people. I don't mean they're people are anxious a hundred percent of the time, but I, what I mean by that statement is a hundred percent of people at some point experience anxiety. Mm -hmm. Uh, if it's been because someone has died, well, you're suddenly anxious because they're gone and, and, uh, the sorrow is very intense. But if you've been sitting in your house alone for a while, you begin to wonder, I wonder what it's like, where has everybody gone and what are they doing out there and what's it like? It's gotten to the point where often people will feel anxious about very common routine habits and activities. Uh, where even going for groceries, frankly, can be unnerving uh, because we're not sure what we're gonna find when we get there, if you're even going into the store. Uh, if you change the mode of shopping, which some of us have, into ordering and picking up, then you don't know what they're going to email you about that they don't have. You know, that you've ordered online, and then you get this notice about, we don't have that, do you want this instead? Look at your screen and think, I don't think so. Um, and so we don't quite know that things are going to come out as we and I think the pandemic has shown us that we can make all kinds of plans, but ultimately not control that much of it. Um, so that's kind of, that is definitely a downside. Anxiety arises when we don't have predictability. And that's what's really important for children, particularly. Often, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in the past when I would work and, and treat children, Parents would come to me and say, oh, my, my child's very hyper, very hyper. And, you know, I would talk about this and meet the child and talk to the parents, and discuss routines and habits. And so if the child didn't have structure in routine or exercise, mm -hmm. et cetera, they really didn't have a way to burn off energy or be able to uh, know what was coming next. So people took a while to have a pandemic routine. Mm -hmm. Some people did. Uh, some people didn't miss a beat. They just did that to themselves. Other folks found it harder. Because remember, we started out with a two-week quarantine, right? Right. Okay, we're doing this as a two-week quarantine. It's like, what? What do you mean now it's six weeks? What do you mean now it's, you know, on and on? And all kidding aside, people were saying, well, when is this going to end? They're still asking that yeah. question. I don't know. Yeah. We honestly. Well, and I found also um, recently I had an experience, um, even just wearing my mask because it's become so political in some places. And I happen to be in Texas, and you get these really these looks like, you know, people are judging you because you're wearing or not wearing a mask. Either way, I mean, I even find myself going, "Wow, I wish all these people would be wearing a mask." Right. And I'm sure they're thinking, wow, why is she wearing a mask kind of thing? But that level, that just being anxious to be out in society with knowing those kinds of things are going on in the background and realizing you're putting yourself maybe in a compromising position um, just to protect your health. So yeah, interesting experiences that are happening for all of us that we've never experienced absolutely. before. Absolutely. That's that. Absolutely right. Jesus, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, talking about um, how we uh, deal with, uh, with the changes to our lives, right? My uh, retirement happened to coincide with uh, part of uh, or during the pandemic, right? So um, there was a lot of things that 
uh, transpired over that course, like I mentioned with some of the, uh, the, the passing of certain uh, relatives, the marriages and the, the births. But from a um, professional standpoint, the, um, uh, and, and I don't, uh, I still intend on, on having a retirement party, but a lot of the, again, social aspects of retirement and Paula went through the same thing with her retirement just recently where people would come by the office, might come by the office and say, hey, you know, congratulations. None of that happened. It was all um, over the um, uh, 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 through, through the uh, remote working conditions. Um, and, and so that was unique. It was different. I, it, it didn't bother me to any great extent, but I think there was a, a, that was a loss. Uh, for me and, and, and hopefully others, uh, whether they were wishing you well or wishing, you know, finally, you know, uh, uh, mean that they were going to get rid of me, you know, either way. <laughs> um, but um, uh, I think uh, that part of it, I think, was, was interesting for me to deal with. Like I said, I, I don't um, necessarily, uh, and, and there might be some grief related to that. Um, uh, but it, uh, I wouldn't say it has uh, unduly impacted me um, as a result. But, you know, we had a, a lot of retirements at uh, Sandia during that, that year that, um, you know, I'm sure, you know, I, I, I missed that uh, with uh, some associates and colleagues there that, uh, you know, saying goodbye to them and things of that nature, but certainly uh, impactful for me. Well, you know, some of them, uh, some retirements were planned and others were a little bit by default. It's like, well, whatever, I might as well get out now kind of thing. So there were, you know, I was reading, you know, the other day in the Wall Street Journal and they're calling it the Great Resignation where, um, uh, I'm trying to read in there, that all of a sudden, people aren't working, where did they go, you know? Right. And so it's different, that's different than retirement, but it's a choice about work. It's about mm -hmm. working, it's about what kind of work, it's about how work is getting done, et cetera. So one of the things is that we typically have plans or we have expectations and people can become upset. There's three reasons people become upset in life. One is that expectations are not met. Unmet expectations create upset. In, uh, we expect to be recognized. We expect to be thanked. And all of a sudden, work is over. Your last day comes and it's out with a whimper. Like, what? What was that? The second is um, thwarted plans. You may have a plan to do something, a plan to travel somewhere, a plan to remodel the house, a plan to do this, that, or the other. And suddenly that plan, something gets in the way. Uh, either you're restricted and you can't leave the country or you can't leave the state uh, or shouldn't anyway. Uh, or sometimes with other things you were going to do, it may be the issue of money or one's health and uh, vitality that you can no longer do it. So our plans are thwarted. And a very simple comparison, it's like thinking, oh, you know, in the old days when you were planning on going out to run some errands in the evening and all of a sudden someone shows up at your door and there went your plan and the store is closed and et cetera. Well, people get upset with that. On a very large scale, we have expectations of how things will be. Weddings were a big thing during the pandemic, okay? Weddings that didn't happen during the pandemic, okay? There had been a lot of, staging planned and money expended in uh, giving uh, deposits, et cetera, for a beautiful wedding plan that didn't happen. And so people had to go to plan B and now it's not the same and people have to kind of circle back and say, what are we doing and et cetera, and kind of, yeah. And the third reason is um, incomplete communication. In incomplete communication, you either don't get heard fully or you are not able to speak your mind fully. Mm -hmm. So whenever communication is incomplete, we're not told what's going on. 
Uh, we couldn't give our input into it. We can't express our feelings about it or our disagreement with it. We get upset. So part of grief is kind of mixed in with all of this upset, which is a little bit different than the profound transitional transformational grief that I've been talking about. But it's part of it because that's how we guide our lives is with our expectations. And people get very upset when they go to their favorite restaurant now and they expect their favorite meal and they still pay the same or higher price only to find out that the cook is no longer And you say, what happened here? This isn't what you used to serve. They're right. It's not. Seems like a big deal, but people really get set off with things like that. Yeah. Okay. So, Michaela, I'd like to bring in um, our participants a little bit. We're getting some yeah. comments in chat um, from Nina, who has a chronic progressive disease and mentions that the isolation was really the hardest for her, not wanting to spend her last days in quarantine. I mean, these are really, it's, that's, you know, a good example of someone really struggling with a difficult situation in life. Um, that many people face. And so how does that play into the experience of grief? Well, it, it, it it's twofold. Like I'm saying, on one hand, there may be plans for how you will have a support team come in and help, or you will do certain activities or go through certain classes, or depending on the level of physical ability that the person has, as opposed to being a homebound uh, disease. Okay. This rendered everybody homebound. Okay. And that isn't the plan. Mm -hmm. So the grief comes with a sense of losing the choice of doing certain things. Mm -hmm. And even if you would choose to do it, it's not happening. Classes are canceled. Centers are closed. Um, people felt a tremendous sense of loss, even with the public libraries. Uh, that closed for a long time because you could do curbside ordering, but it's a, that's a little bit hard, especially when you part of the joy of your life is from going in and looking what's in the library, which, mm -hmm. you know, that's part of my life. I just think, oh, that's so exciting, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, that's that's just one example. The thing about adjusting is the quarantine's forced isolation. That was the whole purpose, the attempt at containment. And, but what happened is people ended up feeling very alone. There were two things. One is people felt very alone, abandoned and afraid, not knowing what would happen with the progression of the disease. Also being told, don't rush to the doctor unless you absolutely have to. So now we know that there are things happening with people's health that were delayed that have progressed and now, you know, that's another health conflict. And I'm not criticizing the healthcare system. I'm not, it was just the situation of the system and how things work or are. Um, the other is though, and I don't know if anybody's thinking this or has said it in the chat, but suddenly people found themselves at home with each other, sometimes with people that they didn't particularly know or really like. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people looking at it like, what are you doing in my space? Or, you know, that kind of thing. Well, they live there too. Or they decided to be in the, if people really did form their um, quarantine little bubbles where you would only communicate or see a certain number of people to try to contain the contagion, um, all of a sudden you're faced with people that you may not really know or haven't gotten along with. or And, and it's like there's not an easy escape. Yeah. It always reminded me, my, my dear friend in grad school was a native Hawaiian, and uh, he used to say that people in Hawaii learn early uh, to get along because on an island, you're going to run into everybody off. <laughs> okay. And that always stuck with me because he just had a wonderful spirit about it. Uh, but all of a sudden, that's what we experienced when our yeah. world shrunk not by our choice. Yeah. We didn't move to the island. The island came to us. Another comment that sort of relates to that is the loss we feel of the life we lived before COVID 
um, it's gone and we don't know if it will ever come back. And um, this person commented, I can see how I have, and I'm going through all stages of grief over just that. Um, and anger that a lot of people are expressing out in the world on top of it. Um, so yeah, that loss of life as we knew it, the title of your talk today, which I think you're going to get a little bit more into as we go forward, but yeah. that's a big part of it. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, on the next slide, I think Paula, it's the next slide. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about what is it that really happened. And uh, it's, a, it's a great segue into further discussing what was in the chat box. And that is COVID came through and it was like having someone topple your game board. You know, I was talking with folks yesterday with the panelists yesterday before today's uh, time together. And I said, haven't y'all had a cousin who just used to come and hit the game board when you were playing and all the pieces flew? And usually they do it when they're losing so that then you can't win. But it felt like somebody toppling life's game board. You know, in modern times, we can say uh, it's like having the cat come and walk across the computer uh, keyboard or the dog. I had a German shepherd that was fed up with me being on the computer and she just came and put her paw on it like that and just wiped out what, you know, I, I restored it. But it was that kind of thing. It, it knocks it off. The problem is with COVID, we've ended up not really knowing what game we're playing. And everything and many things have become suspect. And that is what makes people even more anxious. Where did it start? Where is it going to end? What is going to be next, et cetera? So it's a high anxiety. And I think one of the things that's different compared to other uh, times in history where people had more limited information, with a 24 7 news cycle, we can get ourselves very anxious in hearing the same repeated uh, angst. Mm -hmm. on broadcast okay just like turn it on and there it is again you know but yet when you're alone you turn on the tv sometimes just to kind of have company yeah you know because i turn it on just for the noise just to hear people talk mm -hmm. you no know, that's like I, I do that sometimes it's like oh you know it's, it's kind of like turning on music but it's a little bit different because usually conversation the other thing about covid is it moved the baseline okay and by the baseline it means we expect a certain level of this, that, or the other. And now our baseline. Um, there's continual business, commerce, and government changes as a result. Seasonally now, people are saying, what are we going to do given the supply chain problem? Well, depending on, and I'll talk about, you know, um, with y'all about what helps us get through these things. But the baseline is, where is the bare minimum now? Because it feels like some in some places it keeps getting lowered. Does that make sense? Yes. In other words, we don't know what's on the store shelves. Right. We don't yeah. know um, exactly what the transportation situation is. I mean, people, pe many people have complied with full vaccination, et cetera. So it's not that transportation, like flying somewhere, is not permitted. It's that it's inconsistent. Right. And usually, you know, people say, oh, my life runs like a train. We're always on time. Well, just ask the people sitting in there, mm -hmm. you know, how unpredictable and unnerving that is. So that's part of it is the change in business and commerce, having to do business differently. Um, people who love to go out to eat breakfast, I wondered how they were doing it early on when people were just doing only carry out in restaurants. I like to eat my eggs hot unless they're hard boiled uh, or I'll eat a quiche room temperature. But um, I can't imagine carrying out a fried egg. I'm sure, I know people do it. I know people who do that and they're fine with it. But those are sim simple things like going to carry it out or those say, I, can't let myself eat a really expensive meal in a styrofoam box, you know, those kinds of things. The baseline moves. What can we expect? Uh, what can we expect economically? What will we pay for things uh, or be charged for things? And what are we going, how are we going to manage those? Yeah. Um, especially 
at a certain point in your age where if your income is fixed, it's not like there's an endless supply of revenue coming in. Right. So you're going to say, okay, how am I going to manage that? Mm -hmm. So people now are, are really thinking about how are we going to do Christmas? How are we going to do Thanksgiving? Now, I have never discussed a turkey as much as I have this year. What are we going to do about a turkey? I don't know. We're going to try to buy one. Uh, but let's come up with plan B in case there is a one. Right. You know, and people say, oh, well, you don't have to have a whole turkey. You can have a turkey breast. Well, yeah, but a turkey, a turkey breast comes from a turkey. <laughs> so what's the day? You know, it's going to cost the life of a turkey either way. So it's not like, oh, there's a huge glut of um, turkey breasts. I mean, I, I digress. I'm just saying that what appears to be obvious solutions in some cases really are not. So right. that it well, for and, another plan. And, and the underlying, um, you know, disruption of your traditions, because, you know, in some families, just thinking about the turkey, it's a turkey challenge to see who can cook the best turkey each year. You know, I mean, there's traditions that are being impacted um, by this supply chain issue and are having to adjust, um, right. which, you know, in some cases may not be a bad thing, but it's still brings up a lot of anxiety and not knowing, you know, how to manage what's coming next, I think. Exactly. One of the things about the pandemic, because with every loss, there comes opportunity. Okay, that's what makes it a crisis. There's the loss and the opportunity. The loss is, okay, certain things we don't have, we're not going to do as we necessarily did before. And I'm not being negative about holidays and the turkey and all that. I'm really not. Mm -hmm. But I'm just saying, so what is the opportunity? The pandemic gave us a forced time available. And many people used it to really reflect and decide to become more intentional about what they're doing and how they're doing it with their time and their money and their relationships. So that was an unexpected consequence of the pandemic. When you're sitting around and people say, gosh, I haven't read a book for a long time. Well, you can't read a book if you're driving your car down the street. But if you're sitting in your house, um, you have time to do certain things. Same with people working from home. I can't believe how much I get done. Well, that's because you're not driving around. And so people became more intentional. They became more aware of expenditures. How much am I really spending just to work or just to do this or just to do that? And now that I'm not doing it, I have extra money. Or people who lost their jobs are saying, whoa, mm -hmm. how much can I cut back and adjust to this when I have it? Because it wasn't just that people were socking money away or painting their houses. Many were not working. Right. Or were working or are working under very adverse uh, mm -hmm. One of the third bullet on the slide is the political and, and family disagreements and losses over COVID and the regulations. Uh, people have lost relationships and terminated relationships because of decisions that loved ones have made regarding the pandemic. And some of it isn't, I think some, many of them will not be healed. It will just remain that way because Often it's fueled by a dynamic that's been going on for a while, but this was like a, a final tipping point for many people mm -hmm. and um, taken very personally uh, in many ways. People often can say, oh, that's that about them and not me. But I think that because of the nature of, an, of a disease, a communicable disease, it feels like it's personal to everybody. Mm -hmm. And then when it's fueled by either media or discussions or the reality of how things are going, it just causes the rifts to be even bigger. And so that's huge. That is huge because when things completely open up, whatever they open up to be, uh, some things won't be existing, some relationships. Um, I think the gap between haves and have nots, and we've read about that, yeah. People, some people have more means than others. And we saw that, that gap 
increased a lot more during COVID. Some people simply had to work to survive in jobs that exposed them uh, to greater uh, illness and patient activity. And then I think, you know, there is really COVID fatigue. Now, there's the fatigue that comes with having had this COVID and those lingering symptoms. But then um, there's also just people saying, I'm just tired of hearing this. I just don't want to hear this anymore. I want it to stop and, and et cetera. And people reason differently, usually not the same way. So you can have a very beloved family member who has a whole different rationale for something than you do. And it's real easy to get into the, oh, here we go, you know, kind of um, attitude towards the person. But they really can believe, you know, this happened for a certain reason. It's going to, you know, and it will continue until whatever happens. I don't know. People have all kinds of theories based in fact or based in whatever they think. That so I'll stop, I'll stop my talking about it. Those are the points, the main things that I have seen that have been really hard. But I want to hear from, from yeah. other folks in the chat box and, and yeah. There, uh, Dr. Rivera, there, there's a very poignant uh, post from one of our participants about how it's impacted uh, her life as a um, medical student and uh, impacted her relationship with patients, with individuals dying alone. Um, Allison, I don't know if you want to uh, chime in and, and talk a little bit about that, but who really caught my attention on the chat was that she um, started writing obituaries for uh, little things. Uh, she called them random little things um, that she was grieving in her life and then drawing leaves and flowers on her trees um, on one of our walls for, uh, on the walls for each of our patients. I, I don't wanna put you on the spot, Allison, but if, if you wanna chime in on that, I thought that was a very uh, poignant uh, post that you put on there, especially uh, in your role as a medical uh, student and, and how it's impacted you and your patients and your family. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I, I wasn't able to read all of those postings, so I appreciate it. And I welcome Allison or whoever wants to uh, speak up to do so. Um, yeah, thanks so much for uh, reading the comment. I think um, I had a very different experience during the pandemic than lots of people did and with it came some joys of being able to interact with humans every day and such and also some um, different struggles and I found myself needing a structure in order to kind of move through and get through each day and so that's where the the writing of obituaries came from there's a book of poetry called obit um, I'm forgetting who it's by right now. I'll, I'll look it up and put it in the chat, but um, it was my inspiration for that. And I think that it was uh, really helpful um, for me. So I'd be curious to hear kind of if anyone else developed little things that helped them build structure um, throughout that time. That's, that's a good point. I, I'd like to learn more about what you were writing. Um, if you could share just a little bit more I get a better idea of the nature of, of what you were writing. Was it about your own personal life or was it about the changes in the world or was it about patients that were not surviving? Can you explain it a little bit more to me? Um, yeah, so uh, I... Um... It was about all of those things. And I apologize, I can't start my video at this moment. Um, I'm not in a, in a space where I can do that, but uh, I wrote obituaries for, you know, something as simple as um, not being able to uh, go and meet a friend at a coffee shop or something really small like that um, to the really challenging times where I sat with patients as they were dying and their family couldn't be there. So I think it really encompassed the whole spectrum, um, of both the big losses and the little tiny losses. And I think what I was realizing is that once I could name what I was grieving, it helped me, um, it helped it not feel quite so big. And I think something that happened is lots of the little, little losses, 
really pretty small, um, but when they were all built up together, uh, became significant and uh, overwhelming. So really, it was kind of that process of naming. And, you know, it wasn't anything super eloquent or anything like that, but um, just a little bit about what it was that I was missing and what was important uh, about it to me. So. Well, that, thank you so much for, for going into depth with that a little bit more. What you're really, as I hear you speak, it's becoming clearer, more focused, and you're more aware of it. And, and then the structure is you can also become more intentional in what you do, okay? People, I think, have often gotten very stuck in the anger part of the, the um the phase, so to speak, the grief process. And um, I can only imagine, I don't, I don't work inpatient, okay? I do just only outpatient work. Uh, and I work from home. But I can only imagine the wear and tear, having listened to the reports and reading the data about how busy hospitals were, how exhausting it's been for caregivers. Uh, be they in the hospital or the support group it keeps hospitals and our society running in that way that it's just been exhausting. I know people have often, those who lost loved ones to COVID in particular, have typically expressed two things. And this is what people often express in, in grief in general. There's two big feelings. One is guilt and the other is um, regret. Guilt has a component of intention to it, that you intended to do something and it happened that way and then that all of our impact was negative. That's different than regret. And for COVID, people often confuse the two when they were not able to be with their loved ones. That feel really guilty. We put them in that home and they just, just they died alone without us there because we couldn't get in. And, yeah, all of that uh, that's filled with regret. And they didn't set out to have the person pass away from COVID. So that's, that is so with every loss. What is actually under our control? What is our intent versus what's regrettable? Uh, it's, it's regrettable that certain factors are in operation. We can't control everything. So I don't know if that's helpful or not, but those are other things that I really do see um, very often. Um, because more often than not, people regret rather than, you know, they say, I couldn't save her, I feel so guilty. That we regret that we couldn't. Mm -hmm. For the most part, people did uh, with what they knew and what they had. And, you know, we I think know. we had somebody raise their hand. Yes. There's Al is that Alison Faith? Uh, hi, my name is Sandy. I, I worked for many years with disabled children and their parents. And when when we began this session and you spoke of the uh, lost dream, I that's how I always conceptualized what they were going through. They they bore a child and their dreams were shattered. And it was much to me, it was much harder than losing a child, which I have done. And it was hard because of the relentlessness of it. And I think that that compares to what we're experiencing now. You know, they had to continue feeding this child and getting them to physical therapy and taking them to doctor's appointments and getting a good school situation for them. Uh, there was never any closure for them. And that's that's how I'm experiencing COVID is it's relentless. It, it doesn't go away. Uh, and I think that that's part of the fatigue, but I also think um, we're not used to in our society having to face the ambiguity and the um, unpredictability as you as you mentioned. Uh, and and I think that's taking a great toll on many people, especially on me. Well, I appreciate you bringing that up because I, I think you you really nailed a huge component of it. Um, we really have had for generations now um, 
years ago, Burger King had a campaign slogan or like a marketing slogan rather that was, you know, have it your way. <laughs> and we all think, well, I want it my way. So I want, you know, exactly. you know, um, at best we can drive up and order coffee that way. And, you know, a lot of burger and all that kind of stuff that way if we want. However, people are really angry because of the relentless as well. But underneath it, and I know we have a slide. I don't know if Paul is going to be able to help us put put up this slide that was shared with me yesterday that Tammy brought in. And um, I really would like the group to see it if possible, where I sat with my anger long <laughs> enough until, until she told me her real name was Greek. And really what you're talking about is a parent having faced all that they dreamed about for their child not um not coming to fruition as they had planned okay mm -hmm. and so it kind of feels like just everybody is in a giant tantrum out there you know yep. and it's and it can be very intimidating very intimidating and um so we kind of think well how do we deal with it how, how do we deal with all that because yeah certain things that we thought were going to be a certain way aren't going to happen but we don't want to deal with everybody's anger and attitude, so to speak, on top of it. So people, but I'm I'm wondering if depression couldn't be substituted for anger. Yes, yes, and fear is underneath anger yep. as well. Yep. We fear it's never going to end, or That's right. I'm I'm never going to be able to do whatever, or uh, you know. Um, people really angry about, and I understand it. Some things are milestones, you know, people that couldn't march across a graduation stage or couldn't move into the dorm or whatever. Right. You know, it's not the same um, digitally, you know, virtually. So, but, but your point is, is really true. After a while we learn, um, we learn that that's it. That's part of the acceptance. Mm -hmm. See, when you accept it, it is what it is. Okay, so is the next question. Because mm -hmm. therein lies our control. It doesn't mean we like it. It doesn't mean we have the span of control we either once had or, or currently want. But it really does bring it into mind. What can I change? What can I change? Yeah, yeah. If that makes sense. Uh, let's move on in the interest of time here. Let's move on to the next slide. Uh, Paula. Okay, and on to the next one. Okay, there's our control and resilience. Okay, what can we do? You know, I was <laughs> telling the group yesterday, you know, when you, we read a lot about self-care, you know, and you go and self-care products and all this, and there's candles and oils and stuff, which that can make you feel good temporarily. It, it, it can do it. But there's a lot more to self-care than what you can order online. And by that, I mean being able to keep a routine, being able to set yourself aside so that you can still have common meeting ground with other people. There are some relationships that have had rifts in them over this whole pandemic situation. And yet if the people say, well, we're not going to discuss that. We, we love each other as two people. We're simply not going to discuss that. And when it starts veering that way, it's like, okay, got to go now, you know, kind of thing. But there's self-care that tells us, well, how can we do the very best with what we've got to care and love ourselves? And that's really hard because we often really want other people to come and do it for us. I know I do. It's like, oh, I just have to do that for myself now. And so we get really tired of having to do it ourselves. Uh, you know, again, you know, we're, you know, et cetera. It, it is more than going for facials and nails. It's far, far beyond that. That can be part of it. I'm not minimizing that. But self-care really has to do with self-talk. And it has to do with decisions that we make that are good for us or not. So we can look at our day and say, I made two, one or two really good decisions for myself 
for today. You're practicing self. The other is redefining ourselves. If we decide these are the things that, but I found this developmentally when I turned 40, which wasn't yesterday, um, I found that I didn't want um, to do certain things anymore. I just wasn't going to do certain things anymore. And it happened again when I turned 50 and again when I turned 60. And with a pandemic, son of a gun, if it didn't get a lot clearer, it's like, nope, I'm not doing that anymore. And, and then you read, you know, you could communicate, people say, we're cleaning out the closets during the quarantine. Well, we were emotionally cleaning out stuff too, which was really important. And so we redefined, I'm not going to do certain things. I'm going to let myself say no to some things. And I'm going to let myself say yes to other things. And this is what I've always wanted to do. And I will pursue it however I can within what I have, what I know, and what my situation. And that's a redefinition that has to occur, whether it's death or the end of a relationship or a breakup or a divorce, or it's a pandemic. Building support that people say, yeah, I'm so sick of Zoom, or it shut us off after 40 minutes or whatever the time was. But yeah, it's not the same. It's not the same as sitting in the house with people, et cetera. But boy, it beats on having at least someone to connect with. Okay, so the sense of isolation and loneliness has been tremendous for a lot. One step at a time. If, if we don't learn that lesson, um, is to do it slowly, plan ahead, and have plan B in our pocket. Because um, I think we really were accustomed to the multitasking, et cetera. And one of the things that I've often heard from people concerning a change in themselves during the pandemic is that they've decided, I'm going to do one thing at a time and just really enjoy it. I'm going to do, I'm going to make my list, cut it in half, and that's as far as I'm going to get, maybe. And not pressure themselves. And accordingly, it's also um, self-mercy. One of the things that I hear most of is people scolding and blaming themselves for things that they don't have control of. And so the pandemic and losing loved ones and process of aging, all of that grief brings us to the stark reality of our own limitations. And that doesn't mean it's bad. It just is. You know, I uh, I figured some time ago I wasn't going to be a ballerina. Uh, so that wasn't too devastating. Other things, in all seriousness, yeah, I'm just not real good at them. I didn't. Uh, and those who are close to me understand, graciously tolerate my flaws. Um, but self-mercy is tolerating our own and forgiving ourselves from protection because one of the things that wears people out during the pandemic is what is perceived as and it's fruitless to complain about things that will not change and complaining is a choice we're either going to acknowledge how things are and come up with a plan or whatever handle so the self mercy is um, a really important point. Let me let me go on to the next slide. And there's I listed some resources that I thought might be helpful um, when we can read, share, and do. Um, there you go. Thanks, Paula. Um, the reading those I of course there's a more extensive list, but these are the ones that I think. Uh, well, for one, I've read them more recently, and second, I think they're very relevant today. And one is about grief. It's the beauty of what remains. Um, and it begins talking about the death of a person, but it really applies to all aspects. Like beautifully written, quick read, profound. You don't need to read it in order. It's, it's a keeper. Um, the other is the next right thing. Um, Oh, and I'm getting a note here. It's going to be emailed to everyone who registered. Thank you. 
So the next right thing is basically being able to sift through all the shoulds and what ifs and decide this is what's most important next. So it's the intentionality. The world is flat is basically, uh, you know, and he's rewriting it, I think, or has coming up with a second edition of it or a rewrite. Uh, Thomas Friedman about the world is flat and the role of computers and making us think that everything that there is in the world is ours and we're learning that it isn't. So, uh, at, so I listed him. The next uh, activity is really sharing, which is the next slide. And on the sharing opportunity, uh, I listed the um, support groups for adults. Either some are virtual, some are face-to-face. -face. Most are still uh, uh, virtual, okay? Um, but there are some that are meeting face-to-face -face, and there's a number in the website you can go to. And then there's the Children's Grief Center here in Albuquerque as well. Um, these groups do not charge, they are accessible. See what there is available. One of the things I was delighted to find was also that AARP, which is the last thing listed uh, in doing, because the doing is the volunteering, um, is virtual volunteering. When people say, well, I can't even get out of the house, how am I gonna do anything? Well, AARP has some ideas that if you're able to do that. Some people who don't have um, computers are more isolated. That's another thing that we can do very well. Um, but anyway, the main cities in Albuquerque, um, I didn't list Las Cruces. Las Cruces also has its own uh, volunteerism website that you can go to, as do all the cities, uh, the larger places in Mexico have their own. I did this just for central New Mexico. Hey, any other input? That's a lot of me talk. Anybody else? Once, uh, I just want to say that once uh, New Mexico New gets the hub and the application developed, we will have a resource library that will list a lot of resources like this. So we will, we are keeping what we are being given. Thank you for sharing this information and um, once we get our application built, which hopefully by this time next year, it'll be roaring and available for everybody, and we'll have these resources available. Thank you for reminding me about that, Paula. You had mentioned it, and, and that's going to be wonderful because it's all at our fingertips in one mm -hmm. place. So yeah. that's, that's a really good resource. Any other feedback? Any other feedback? We have a few minutes before we sign off for today. Yeah, any lessons from the pandemic? I, I just want to say for self-care, the pandemic taught me really to examine how much I had looked to other people for self-care. And because I couldn't go out for self-care, it really made me rethink how to be responsible for my own self-care. So that's a very really valuable. good point. Mm -hmm. And and Paul, I think that's such a great um, point. point. Um, and that's something that sometimes we forget, um, especially as we start having grandchildren and things of that nature, is that if we don't take care of ourselves and we don't um, uh, uh, remain healthy, uh, that's going to potentially shorten uh, our time with our family and our loved ones. So it's extremely important that we take time uh, to do whatever we need to maintain our physical, spiritual, emotional health, um, because that's going to uh, extend our time. And I think the point here is that it's better that we have a longer period of time that we can share with our family versus an intense, shorter period of time uh, where we're not taking care of ourselves. So that's a, that's a great point, Paula. Thank you for clarifying that, Jesus. That's a really good point because the balance of the spirituality, the, the nutrition, the exercise, the productivity, doing something that we're good at, that we love doing, um, that is what keeps us healthy. Mm -hmm. And uh, to be very mindful of that in balancing it, uh, including the spirituality, however a person chooses to define it, 
is really important because it's the hopelessness and the futility that can be very difficult. And it's up to us to find still that there are things for which we hope it can, can affect. Um, maybe not as we had thought, but still can do it at, of some point. One of the phrases that we use to promote this today's talk, um, Dr. Rivera, was um, the idea that there are so many layers of grief that we're all experiencing. And I really appreciated uh, the last phrase on that list that you use of, about self-mercy. But I think it's also true that we need to be merciful with others because who knows how many of those layers of grief each person is dealing with. Um, but I love that concept of self-mercy, just giving yourself a break, because exactly. it's a lot to deal with these days that we're all trying to manage, and in a very deep level, I think, that sometimes you're not even aware of. Um, so anyway, I really love that right. self-mercy. And, and, and you're right, you know, we don't know what other people are going through. Right. We don't fully know. And it may be something that we would think is very small, but it's very significant. That. So um, a gentle hand towards ourselves and towards others would go a long way, um, especially in traffic. Especially, yes, <laughs> that is true. So I just want to invite any last uh, questions today. If anybody uh, have any other comments. Great, well, we really appreciate, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just, I wasn't going to, I was just reading the comments about self-mercy. Oh, and self-mercy. <laughs> yeah. Bingo, bingo. Bingo, bingo. Well, thank you all for being here today. And really quickly, um, if Jillian could get ready and bring up our other slide deck, I just want to say thank you so much to Dr. Rivera. This is Welcome. a conversation that I think we could uh, continue for another couple of hours and I'll continue to garner some additional insights of how to manage these multiple layers of grief that we're feeling today. So I will email everyone the resources. Dr. Rivera is also in private practice and uh, information about how to contact her will be on that email as well. Um, another just quick shout out to our amazing sponsors. We really appreciate them. Hey, Suze, thank you so much for participating with me today on this panel. And yes, to let everybody know, we're going to go from grief to happiness. Happiness in the Art of Flourishing is our next event. And our last event, I might mention, for 2021, that's going to happen on November the 12th. So if you haven't registered, please do so. And finally, I just invite, if you have ideas on topics that you would like to see here, um, please let us know about them. We invite your input. We want to know what people that are paying attention to New Mexico New and following us. Um, our community is wanting and needing, so please share that information. And if you're so inclined to make a donation, we would appreciate you keeping us in mind. We're working very hard to get that app up and going and um, available to uh, New Mexicans age 50 plus. So we appreciate everyone's support. So thank you again. 